Okay, we should be good. Hello, everyone. I am um, Terry R. Byers. I'm the moderator for this um, virtual art talk. Um, there are probably people in the audience who know me, um, former students like my three, three um, amazing guests today. But um, I am a writer, uh, independent curator, and since 1990, I have taught at uh, several art schools, including most recently the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I split my time between LA and Chicago, and I was the chair of painting from 2013 to 2018. I'm now fully back in Los Angeles, and it is my great pleasure um, to... Um, participate in this great cause for the Venice Family Clinic um, and to thank you all for joining us for these Venice Family Clinic Art Walk and Auction Virtual Art Talks. This is the last one of the, the series for this year. Um, the Venice Family Clinic created these talks as an opportunity for their community of supporters from collectors to artists to simply the art curious to share and learn about the incredible artwork featured in the silent art auction. The art community support of Venice Art Walk in turn supports the clinic services, which include primary and specialty care, mental health services, dental, vision, substance abuse treatment, vision services, child development services, health education, prescription medications, street medicine for people experiencing homelessness, and health insurance enrollment. The clinic has also, as we wouldn't be, shouldn't be surprised, has been on the front line of the COVID-19 crisis, providing testing and vac vaccinations. Um, I'm very grateful to Andrea Feldman Falcioni, who reached out to the clinic to suggest me to, as a participant. Um, I've known about the Venice Family Clinic for years. Um, as I've said to the team there, I assume back when I was a full-time faculty member at Otis out in Westchester, again, I wouldn't know this, but I assume that I would have students that, that um, relied upon um, the Venice Family Clinic. Um, and the Art Walk is, was well known to me, so I'm very happy to be participating and I'm planning to continue participating by helping to um, suggest artists for the future. Um, the Venice Family Clinic and Art Walk Auction was founded in 1979 by artists and volunteers who wanted to ensure no one in their neighborhood would go without health care, no matter their income, insurance, or immigration status. The spirit of art and community continues today, and that leads me to this afternoon's uh, discussion with Venice Art Walk 2021 participating artists, all three of whom I first met when I worked with them when they were when they were students. Um, Kim Fisher, Jennifer Moon, and Mario Yabara Jr. And just gonna do a very quick, a very quick bio. What I will I'll say is this is not an artist talk. We're not going through their careers. This is gonna turn into a conversation around art and education, its relationship to community, et cetera. But I did just in my making sure I had all my facts straight. One thing I realized is that the three of you were all born in the same year. <laughs> you what? Were all yeah, all three of you were born in the same year. <laughs> so um, Kim Fisher um, received her uh, BFA uh, from UCLA in 96 and her MFA at Otis in 98. Jennifer Moon also received her BFA with Kim at UCLA in 96, went on to get her MFA at Art Center in 2002. Mario Yabara received his BFA at Otis in 1999, and then went on to get his MFA at UC Irvine in 2001. So we have four very great art programs, institutions represented here in terms of the three, our three guests, um, undergraduate and graduate um, experiences. And um, I don't want to go into all the ways that I connected with the three of them, but they're, they're, they're connections that all mattered to me back at the time. Um, I could tell with all three of them that they were the real deal from the very beginning. So this is great for me to bring them together. And again, all three have been showing internationally since the mid to late 90s in galleries, museums, institutions. I encourage you, they are all uh, 
uh, wonderfully Googleable, you know, to find more examples of their work. So um, with that, I, I did want to start. Uh, so anyway, welcome to the three of you. Maybe just say a quick hello, and we're going to get you talking soon. Hi. Hello. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Terry, for inviting us. I'm very thrilled. So uh, the next slide, I, I wanted to um, give a shout out to the auction and also to the legend that was John Baldessari, who passed away in early 2020. Uh, John was a longtime supporter of the Art Walk and Auction. Um, this work is in the current auction, but John's uh, status as maybe the most legendary artist teacher, his long career here in Los Angeles um, as a very important contemporary and conceptual artist, but also his work as a teacher at CalArts at UCLA, um, the, 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 the numbers of students that directly work with him, but his impact, I think, impacted any of us who have worked in art education, um, myself included. So I just wanted to um, kind of honor him at the beginning by acknowledging, you know, the spirit of John, you know, very, the very tall man that is standing now above all of us um, as, as we continue um, this journey that, that, you know, artists continue to be on. So from here, I just asked the three artists, we're going to look at the, the, um, the work that they've uh, uh, given to the auction. And then I asked them each to just pick one image. So we're going to do this rather quickly, just go in order. So Kim, if you want to just talk very quickly about this and, and then your, the, the, the image you selected after the work, that would be great. Sure. Thanks, Terry. Um, so this piece that I've donated to the auction, um, Study for Ripple, um, is part of an ongoing series of artworks that I've been working on. Um, they start primarily from um, a collage practice that I have ongoing in my studio where I make small collages. And the collages have to do with location, um, vista, um, edges, and, um, and actually like print, because um, uh, most of them are taken from some type of print um, origin, uh, i.e. magazines, photographs. Um, and then um, the paintings are kind of interpretations of these collages. And um, what you're looking at here is uh, a small painting that's on dyed linen. The linen uh, starts off as kind of your jute, kind of brownish, hempy type color. And so it's dyed um, a very dark, deep shade of black to contrast with the shape of the um, the image or the cutout, which here is uh, a piece of aluminum um, painted um, with oil paint and an airbrush. And then it's affixed onto the linen uh, panel, linen covered panel. Um, and then we have a detail too, I think. Yeah, here we have yeah. a detail. Um, and so there's a, there's a depth, um, the materi materiality of, of the piece is, is emphasized through the way the linen is stretched um, it's on the bias, um, the kind of depth that the aluminum has and its edge in relationship to the surface it's sitting on, and then the nature of which um, the image is kind of painted. Um, it's, it's like lots of little dots. So it's like, it's very painterly when you see it in person. From far away, it's more clear. And then when you get up very close, it kind of dissolves. Um, I picked this image because um, Thought it was like you know Venice is close to the ocean and um, this is an ocean kind of uh, piece ripple like a kind of close up of, of, of a current and um, it kind of has like a ominous feel to it um, which I thought was kind of fit, fit the feel of the year we've just had. Right. Um, and then you yeah. selected um, uh, the next image you selected yeah. a great view um, from the great biennial that happens at the Hammer. Uh, made in LA, and um, actually I was in the same uh, exhibition with Jennifer Moon, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is an image from Made in LA, and again, it has to do with kind of vista and location. It's, it's made in the same nature, um, 
as, as the other piece I just kind of spoke about. Um, in this case, there's a, a wallpaper that's a big kind of giant photograph collage that kind of relates to the nature in which the work is kind of, um, you know, begins. Um, and so I thought this would be a nice image for you to see how kind of the, the, the work is exhibited and, and it's kind of life um, in, in um, exhibitions. Great. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. All right, Jennifer. Yeah, hi. I, also, I love Kim. I love seeing you, Kim. I'm, Kim and I have known each other for so long. We went to undergrad together, so it's so great. Well, to see I, you. I, will, I will just interject quickly here. I didn't know either of you when you were undergrads at UCLA. I knew you both when you were grad students, but I was the juror for the undergrad UCLA show the year you both, <laughs> I selected both of your work from slides in my living room here in Los Feliz, where I had to darken my living room to go through everything. And I, I didn't know, I didn't know any of you, but I picked both of you. So uh, anyway. Uh, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 19, it would have been 96, right? It was the year you graduated, I think. 95. 95. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, this, this, this piece I joined is called I Heart. Karen Broad. Karen Broad is a feminist theorist, um, most well known for their uh, theory on gen agential realism. And I'm really interested in uh, quantum physics and thinking about quantum worldviews. And so this is kind of a diagram that illustrates Broad's um, kind of diffractive and performative methodologies and moving away from a kind of classical Newtonian physics worldview that kind of relies on reflection and representationalism. Uh, I'm, my work is like really um, invested in notions of revolution and um, expanding beyond what I call the 5%, which is beyond or attempting to reach beyond binaries, hierarchies and capital. So this is, uh, yeah, so Karen Braz is just a, a very, uh, someone who I am deeply influenced by. So, yeah. And she's, and, con <laughs> she's, she's contemporary, right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Speaking at UC Santa Cruz, uh, 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 a student of Donna Haraway, in, um, right now Broad's in the History of Consciousness at UC Santa Cruz. Okay. Um, they have a book called Meeting the Universe Halfway, and their interpretation of quantum physics makes the most sense to me, and it's totally <laughs> radical in, in, in a way, because it like questions notions of like authenticity and originals. Anyways, I won't get too into it, but <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Get this diagram, put it in your house to remind you to always reach beyond the 5%. <laughs> right. And the, um, the diagram is not so readable on screen, but I have read it you know, myself. And it just, it, it really is fascinating. And again, a slice into your work. And then if you want to move to the next, to the image. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah so this was, this was your last show in LA, your last gallery yeah. show? Yeah. At Commonwealth and Council, um, and so this is kind of like my attempt to enact or embody a certain quantum emergence. Um, this was a collaborative work with my nuclear family, my mom, my dad, and my brother, where we attended like a IRL uh, therapy with a therapist. And then we also made avatars in a virtual world called Avakin Life, and we met there weekly as well um, without the therapist. And the subjects that emerged within the app, the kind of the virtual world was wholly different <laughs> from how us as people or subjects emerged IRL, even with the therapist or just within the family. I'm really interested in it in trauma. So a lot of like familial trauma stuff came out, both like from my parents are immigrants. They grew up during the Korean War. It's um, thing, uh, like experiences, which they've never shared um, came out in this virtual world. And then, um, also just like trauma within the family. Um, so it was pretty remarkable um, kind of what, what emerged and how different we were in these different kind of spaces and platforms. And that, that, that talks to this quantum emergence or entanglement that Barad um, talks extensively about in their book. Um, yeah. Right, and, and your work also includes uh, performance and you know lots of different modes. I, I would just add that too, that, that we're not seeing here, but um, um, expanding the, 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 you know, like kind of complicating the quantumness even of what an artwork could be, I guess, you know, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think your work was that before we started using that word. I mean, I, I happen to be very interested in quantum physics myself right now. Um, it, I've been using it in writing. Um, so, um, um, I want to check out, uh, their book, um, for sure. So I might be 
bugging you in the future, Jennifer, about other things. Oh my things. God, yes. I would always, always love to talk quantum physics. Anyone, please, yes. Sure, great, great. So thank you, thank you. All right, Mario. Um, hey, everybody. Um, first, I want to remind us, I've been drinking out of this cup that says, do awesome stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about the Baldessari piece when you showed him like I will not make any more boring art and um it's like oh my cup kind of reminds me of Baldessari a little bit and uh, this work now that you brought him up I I was wondering about it because it also kind of reminds me of the work he did where he did the self-portraits in disguises yeah. and, um, so this is a, a little photograph kind of like a passport size photograph of me it's called self-portrait as Andy and uh, you know I have this Andy Warhol wig and um, my work so is there, kind of, you can let's go to the details so people can see yeah okay you can, see, yeah. you can see it and it, it's really it's like a kind of a passport size photograph and um, they come from like this body of work I've been believing in this kind of notion of versions like you know like versions like I was thinking about like in music like singers get to do versions of songs and they do like cover songs and everybody's doing versions and covers and I was thinking like as artists we don't we don't we always are lifting things like we're always kind of procurers of things and bringing things into our work but we don't allow ourselves the kind of lateral space to be like oh I'm going to make a version of this and I and last and I was like oh how can I do versions so I was thinking about like this series of kind of self-portraiture and uh, so I would like go in the studio and um, I wish I was a painter like I I think I, I, I always say like I started off my art isness as being a painter like when I see Kim's work I'm like oh she's always been so consistent and like <laughs> like made paintings and I'm like man I wish I could like be that but like my ADD takes over and I I just I can't so I'm like oh man what can I do so I've been doing these kind of works that are like go into the studio like look around and like I'm, what do I find oh I find this Warhol wig I put it on I take a self-portrait oh I go around the studio I find this and turn it into works and over the years now they guess they become like a series of versions of kind of self-portraiture or selfies um and uh and I was thinking about the studio also with Andy you know we all have art heroes and I guess Andy was one of is one of my art heroes and um I was like man what 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 kind of space could he feel and um what kind of shoes what size kind of shoes he would have to feel for myself and um especially within like a contemporary art model which kind of pop culture is the kind of beginning of so so yeah like, I I would just say I don't just interject a bit I, I I think it wouldn't be wrong to think of his factory as its own it was an art school in its own way yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I was thinking about that too that's why I send you this language slide because right I, so if we go to the next um um yeah, yeah so, so this is what yeah to talk yeah. about this because it's so important yeah, so if, if I'm like Andy and like kind of taking on, trying to fill his shoes as Andy, I was thinking about Slanguage a little bit as being like this kind of factory, like, you know, he had his factory in New York and it was a kind of de facto art school too. You think of all the musicians that came out of there, like the Velvet Underground and all these people and filmmakers and actors and other artists. I was thinking about Slanguage because uh, Slanguage now with myself and Carla and some other friends, we started it in 2002. So next year will be 20 years that we've been running this kind of studio that's also been a de facto art school and oh, with exhibition space. And we started initially in the neighborhood I grew up in, but now it's kind of, we've also had a bunch of different homes. We were in LAX art for a while in the 2012 Made in LA. We took over LAX art on uh, La Cienega. And um, yeah, so it's kind of been like, I kind of think about like these kind of bigger, like art luminaries, like a Baldessari or, or like a Andy Warhol and like trying to figure out like what are my versions like what, what could I contribute in relationship to like a version of that and allow myself to to occupy that space because you know originality is like it's kind of I don't know it's kind of it's kind of I don't know overwork overused <laughs> and I'm like oh what can I do as an artist 
especially a young artist. And I think that that when I was younger, now I'm getting to be, um, I don't know what I am, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, there's um so yeah, uh, I'll, 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 I'll tell you what you are, Mario. You are, you are a, um, you are filling the shoes in your own way of the likes of Baldessari, you know, in terms yeah. of, and you yeah. you just provided me a great segue to where, you know, um, so, so, um, lots of things that I have to say and I want you guys to say to each other. So, um, but let's go to the next, which is the last slide, just to reiterate that the, 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 the auction is available to see on Artsy. Um, you have until noon Pacific time, LA time on the 12th. Um, I've looked through the whole list and there's lots of great stuff. You know, it just couldn't be a better cause. Um, so please, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, um, please do so. Um, one thing I will say as a writer, a critic, is that I appreciate the real rage. You know, it's not just like the art star art world or this art world, like there's a real rage. And that's what's motivating me to want to um, shake the trees a bit and, and get some, get bring the artists that I know in this community um, maybe to the table um, to be involved with the with um with the art walk um in the next few years so thank you to three of you for those quick introductions i know it's hard to be quick in those situations but i think let's um let's switch to sort of the talking head um the talking head um moment of this and you know we've got uh 25 30 minutes tops you know so um so I, you know, what, one thing I didn't say or ask each of you yet, maybe each of you quickly just say what your current teaching, what you've been doing in, in terms of teaching right now. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so um, I've been teaching uh, as an adjunct faculty member in the graduate faculty at Art Center um, for since, I don't know, I guess seven, seven, for 17 years, um, which is wild. And um, throughout the years, I've taught um, visiting at UCLA undergrad and grad and um, at Otis. And uh, yeah, it's really important um, and, and exciting uh, to meet all these different people um, that are some, some of my students are now some of my best friends. <laughs> I know that feeling. So Jennifer, you're at Otis now. Yeah, so I just started at Otis. This is my, I just finishing my second year. Um, I, I feel very fortunate to get like a full-time teaching position at Otis in um, Sculpture New Genres. And then I also started uh, teaching or being visiting faculty at Bard MFA um, for in film video. I started around the same time. Um, and then over last summer, Commonwealth and Council hosted like a Commonwealth and Council summer school um, and uh, started the Revolution School. Um, it, so we meet every other Tuesday. So then that's like a side thing and super inspired by you, Mario. And like, oh, you know, with such language is such a like inspiration in like your work with these kind of alternative modes of, of school. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So like, so I said, uh, for the past 20 years, I've been running a kind of de facto art school with language. So we take on artists from the neighborhood, we take on interns, we take on apprentices, we take on all these different folks that work with us in the studio, and then they teach their own classes and they do all this stuff. Um, and it's kind of been interesting now after 20 years to see the growth of all those students, like Kim saying, like your students become like your friends and kind of extended family. And now I see some of my students are having their their real families like their own babies and all that kind of stuff and you're just like wow they're they're growing I remember when they were little like that and I've taught at every school imaginable I imagine on the west coast for visiting artists I've taught at the CCA and Otis and I taught at UCLA for the longest period of time in their new genres department I've taught at Williams College I've taught uh I brought you to SAIC yeah, SAIC, yeah, I also visited, <laughs> visited everywhere. 
And then as of late, we've kind of, I've kind of left a regular institutional teaching and with Nato Thompson, formerly of Creative Time and artists like Mel Chin and Janina Tony, we started this thing called the Alternative Art School, which is like an online international art school. And uh, that's been kind of fun to have, like, it's really crazy when your students are like in India or Pakistan or something and you're like, eight o'clock in the morning here it's like middle of the night over there and you're going through instruction but um I was that's been what I've been doing lately and this summer I'll be able to teach an intensive with the alternative art school and um so yeah that's where I'm at in terms of teaching great well I, you know I wanted you all to uh sort of list that to reinforce that you know when when I came up with this idea was that this that you know, Los Angeles has such a history of the artist teacher. You know, there's the cliched idea that, you know, when I started teaching in 1990 in New York, you know, it was still this kind of cliche. It wasn't really true, but there was this sort of myth that like, you know, that you didn't really want people to know you were teaching if you were an artist, that it was very separate. And Los Angeles, um, you know, there are all sorts of, Los Angeles doesn't respect boundaries in the same way on so many levels. That's what's made it so viable for me I, moving I think here. It's because we have a history of occultism well there's a history of all sorts of things it's like like i always say like if you take my galleries for example you know the ferris gallery which if the audience doesn't know is a very important gallery here in the 1950s um you know ed ruche started there robert Irwin, ed keenholz if you take those three artists for example like the fact they were all in Ferris. And I used to argue with people in New York saying like, I think those three artists were more interested in what they what they related to in each other's work than what made each other different. Oh. You know, these are three very different arts. So like in New York, you had Donald Judd being like, if you weren't on his, if you were with him, you were against him. You know, Smithson, Mary Hyman always tells a story about Smithson being drunk and her just like winding him up by trying to asking him about David Hockney and him just exploding, you know, like, uh, so this, there, there's this kind of, there's a different sort of mindset, but I don't want to get sidetracked. What I want to bring it back to is that it works perfectly that I've got the three of you here that are so connected in many ways, but I'm going to use your point, Mario. It's when you're talking about Kim's work, like just like you look at Kim and there's this kind of envy or this kind of like, I want to do that, but I can't. I actually think that drives every, every artist I know, I think is driven by that. And I guess that's a place to start. Like you are all three very different, but I have this feeling that like you get each other in ways. And I'm wondering if any of you want to talk about that as a place to start. Well, uh, well, like just to piggyback real quick, because I, I, when I was an undergrad, gra uh, Kim was in graduate school at Otis, and I, so I've been seeing her work now uh, twenty some odd years or however that has been, and and when I see her new work, this work that she just showed for the Made in LA show, I, I still see the continuum of her ideas. They're like the through lines of her ideas of of like. She doesn't like the edges of things. Like edges of things get like frayed and broken, and <laughs> and, and that's always been in there. Like you know, since sure. I remember. And, um, no borders. No borders. <laughs> yeah, like it's always been like cocked. You know, it's always like cocked, and she's always been struggling against that picture plane relationship of like the rectangle and what boundaries that has for her. And you see the rebellion in her, which for me, I'm like, yeah, I see the spirit, which is like what I think I'm, I'm talking about. It's like, oh, how does she do that? Like, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like for, for me, someone who's like super conceptual, like listening to Kim, like, for example, like you sharing about your work, um, I get like, I can so get into like how you're talking about the material and the materiality and stuff and it's like such a different approach from what I how I think about it it's like really it's exciting it's like then I then I can kind of get into I can get into different aspects of of being or or making through you and um I think that's like one of the biggest I don't know joys and like kind of like radical things about teaching is like seeing how everyone works in their relationships to like ideas and materials and like other people and institutions and yeah i think that that's the fun part about being an artist i always try to tell my students that 
the the best thing is like getting to meet other artists and talk to them because they're always like, how did you get into that? Like, what made you like pursue that question, that line of questioning for your work? Like, then the artist starts explaining to you, and you're just like, I would have never went there. Like, and that's really fun. Yeah. Kim, I think, you know, not, not to put you on the spot, but I remember your arrival to the Otis MFA and like, it just seemed at first, like you were so fully cooked in a way, you know, like you were just, I was, I remember just being blown, like, I'm like, wow, this one is like humming. Like, it's just like ready to it. But you know, I think especially graduate school is about the sort of undoing of things too. Sure. I mean, I mean it, you know, I did had, I had come from a uh, UCLA undergrad where, you know, I had, you know, four years of, of Jennifer Moon and, uh, her exciting kind of, you know, wor working alongside her. I mean, you know, yes, I've been making painting, but Jennifer has been very, you know, there's definitely been a thread um, throughout her, all her work. Um, so making paintings or trying to interact with painting and then seeing what Jennifer is doing, like the side, you know, in the, in the next class or in the same classroom, along with like, I don't know, uh, uh, other other people that were there at the same time, like Tr Trisha Donnelly, and and uh, just you know, it just was like wild. It was like a hotbed of activity, and everyone really um, loved each other, and it was like family. But it was also there was a little bit of competition in that family, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's uh, a really good point, Kim. Like I remember when I was at Otis at undergrad, there was there was like that I always say that. Going to school is good because you get this kind of friendly competition that Kim is talking about. And I always tell my students, I was like, imagine you're break dancers and your friend <laughs> jumps in and does 20 spins. And then you're going to be like, wait a minute, I'm going to do 25 spins, right? Like, like if you could do 20 spins, like I'm going to do 25 spins. And that Otis, when I was in school, I felt that way because I had to like Jean and Ruben Ochoa and like I mean, Ochoa. I just want to interrupt and tell the audience that like Mario Mario's days as an Otis undergrad, there it was a high powered group. It, it, it impressed us faculty. We it impressed us faculty. Yeah, so if you were to see them in the wood shop, like cutting wood to make their stretcher bars or something, you're like. What you're here at eleven o'clock at night? I'm gonna stay till twelve o'clock at night. <laughs> there was like a friendly competition. It was like friendly competition. I'm wondering how, like, because I feel I hear like Kim talk about love a lot or like friendship and same with Mario and thinking about like how that. I'm also thinking about like like you know, I'm also thinking about transgress and like thinking about like. Um, like Natalie Loveless's new book, How to Make Art at the End of the World. And uh, both of those texts like talk a lot about love and like how love kind of changes. It's like, competition. It's like competition within like, you know, within another context could be kind of like really ruthless and har harmful, but within like, within this love, comes in, like, I mean, just even like listening to us talk about each other, there's like so much like, respect and admiration um and there's like a different type of competition that emerges from that from a love space definitely i feel like i'm breaking up a little bit so yeah someone was I'm breaking, breaking up, up. Sure. like yeah, someone was breaking up sure. am i back um yeah, I mean, I completely mean, like, agree what you're saying. Like, I, I felt like, uh, you know, the kind of community that like existed was really kind of exciting. I remember seeing you do performances and just being like, "What? She's taking on like she has this alter ego and she's made all these charts and she's." Maybe like the things like what I kind of was doing or what was important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's all been great to see what are the artists. I think that's the best thing about it. I think that's the best thing about it. Terry, you're muted. Yeah, also, is, is it 
Is it just me or is the is there something funny going on with the? No, there's something going on. I don't know. There's something okay, going on. Um. Well, I guess we just try to push through. Yeah. But can I can I say something about? Can I, can I say something about? Can you all hear me? <laughs> yeah, I yes. just, I tried to mute myself to see if that helps. Like, I wonder if we all mute. Will that help? Yeah. yeah. Except for you, Mario, because you're going to say something. Okay. I, I was just going to say something about teaching, I guess, like from our trans, my transition, at least from kind of being a student into being a teacher. Um, I kind of, it kind of happened kind of simultaneously because right when I got out of grad school, we started this language and all this stuff, but we were already kind of teaching at schools. But um, you're, you, you opened up the set with uh, that Baldessari image. And like I said, I was teaching new genres at UCLA for about 10 years from like 2008 to 2018 and um, as an adjunct. And like somebody like, like Baldessari weighs so heavy, like, their, their presence uh, is so big within like a kind of philosophical pedagogical approach within the, the places that they were just in school in general, right? And, uh, and I would have teaching nightmares. Like I was telling you guys this yesterday, I would have like anxiety nightmares about having to go and teach my class. And the one that I remember vividly was that I was teaching a seminar class, not too unlike the classes that I would be in with you as a student, Terry, and I was trying to like give the students information and in walks Baldessari in my dream, like he walked into my classroom and like all the students at first are all like so starstruck by him, of course. And, um, but he started talking and I had to get up and like have like a shoving match with Baldessari. And I remember he had like those long arms cause he was so tall. And I was like, no, you can't talk to my students. Like you already exist so large in like our framework. Like you have to go outside. And I was like pushing him out of my classroom and I took him out to the hallway. And I was like, you can't come back in. Like, this is my class. And, um, and, and those, because those kind of like pedagogical, frameworks that you know somebody like him and I, I also was teaching new genres at UCLA so I would hear these legendary Paul McCarthy uh, assignments that he would give and I'd be like oh man how are my assignments ever going to live up to those assignments like one kid told me like oh one of my friend that I went to school there he was like yeah one time um, Paul McCarthy told us that from this class to the next class, we had to bring a thousand dollars. Like that was our assignment. And I was like, oh, like, how am I gonna get these kids to bring a thousand dollars to class? <laughs> like, how's that gonna happen? So there's some real, like real pressure, like when you're teaching in these schools, like to live up to these kind of presences that, you know, these big luminaries had in, in teaching there. Yeah. Can, can I just, I just want to interject because you're making me all nostalgic for my own. I told the group yesterday, you know, I started teaching in 1990 because the very important critic poet, John Yao, called me up one day. I had been writing for a couple of years and he said, I've been teaching this graduate uh, class on criticism for the MFA at Pratt and I don't want to do it anymore. So I told the chair, you're going to do it. And that's how I started teaching, you know, that, that I just fell into it. I was the same age as my students when I walked in the door. So to go in, you all started relatively young, too, to go in and have those models, you know, to have the, the, that um, um, sense of, of intimidation, I guess, on some level, but also, again, a kind of healthy competition. Um, um, go ahead. So, yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking about what Mario, what you're saying. I mean, I love your, the dream. It is so, like, significant to me because it's, like, it's a changing. I mean, also thinking about, like, how these luminaries or these famous people. I mean, I also was taught by, like, super famous people. I mean, you know, we went to we went to school in the 90s. It was, like, the, the era of the art stars and like, that was, like, the thing. But it's also, like, it, your dream is, like, an indication of the changing of the art world and, like, you're like, no, <laughs> like this is, you're, you're, you know, like when, what happens when these uh, figures become like fixed, like noun or like an identity? And then what happens to like the verbing and like what happens to ideas of learning and education? And I think then it becomes like an opportunity where these, 
these figures become analytics for us to understand what was happening at that time in the era. Like, oh yeah, like, oh, bringing a thousand dollars, like that is making like huge assumptions about like who has access to art school and who these people are. And then like, you know, and, and it gets us to then consider these things, you know, consider like who has access to art school, what kind of like communities are we teaching? And like, what is it that we're, yeah, like what is, what is possible in this kind of this analyzing of the makeup of like higher education? Um, yeah. uh, I'll just, you know, I, I want to ask you guys a question bouncing off of that, but I also want to iterate, I was very impressed to learn, you know, Otis is one of the most diverse higher education institutions in the country right now. And I, even when I taught there in the nineties, I always appreciated that about that, that they were able to get a pretty diverse population. It's an ongoing struggle. Um, but the question I have was, do you think that back to Mario's dream and Jennifer, your reaction to it, and I know Kim can weigh in on this too. Do you think that the shift in that artist teacher thing here has been benefited by a kind of stabilization of what we think of as the LA art world, you know, in terms of galleries and structures, and it's now allowing the artist teacher or art education to sort of function in a different way because Again, as someone who moved here, I first started coming in 1990 and moved here in 94, there was this real sense that like that was all being built up and we're all working to sort of build this infrastructure for that aspect of the art world. And that the art school was so solid and, and really dominant. And now that power balance is shifted, but maybe instead of hurting art education, it's actually helping it now in terms of opening things up. I don't know if anyone wants to take that on. Mario, you're muted. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. It's kind of, it, well, the, the need for an MFA is shifting, right? Like, I think that, like, as a, as a person in LA, you are kind of, if you're in school at a certain time, you're kind of being groomed to go into an MFA program, which for me, I was thinking still stands for motherfucking artist program, right? But now... Um, now, like you're getting these young artists coming out of like a UCLA undergraduate program, and they're already going straight into the Whitney, so uh, biennial. So the, there's there's a little bit of shift for like what is being like what artists are being groomed for, and then they were like, oh, you get an MFA because that's how you start teaching. And I don't know if maybe with the kind of expansion of the art world in general here, or what I, I would say art worlds, Terry, with like an S. It's like there's like a multiplicity. It's like a poly thing. Um, yeah, I just I, just inter, just interject. I, the the commercial, the business art world has stabilized. Yeah, since the ninety, so, it so is. So maybe it's more of a choice. Yeah. I don't know if it's more of a choice. If you have, like, if you have to, it's not a choice. If it's, but it, I think it's like that's not the only option for an artist. Like, is to teach. Like, there are a lot of other things that people do after school and that are still creative or just even off of their work that isn't about just teaching where I feel like at a certain point that's what we are all being groomed for like and it wasn't like a, a negative thing like it was just part of the flow of what we did. I think though that like I mean you know in terms of like a, a graduate program like it's it's uh for me, I never really envisioned that I would like be teaching. Like it just kind of like fell into it. Um, but like the graduate programs I always thought were like so interesting because it's like, it's really like the ultimate kind of like, you know, it's just like endless discussion of like art and ideas, Yeah. you know? And, and, and it occurs on a, you know, it, you know, you're in an atmosphere where it's multi-generational usually. Mm -hmm. So you thought, you know, someone like a John Baldessari, a Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe, then you have uh, someone younger, like a, you know, Richard Hawkins, Stan Douglas, or, you know what I mean? Then you have like younger people that have just, that are much younger artists that have like brought, you know, they're, they've just kind of entered the art world. So you've got like these kind of generational kind of points of view um and ideas kind of coming together that are like where are you going to get that in like you know a 10-week class yeah i mean that's like amazing 
Um, Cause you'll say, oh, you know, and also then with the students too, you know, the students, you'll say, oh God, like, I mean, part of what I really enjoy about teaching is that like through the years you, I mean, you keep yourself kind of young or really, you get to, it's like you have an insider's like view of what like people are like thinking about and what's important, what, what, how people are thinking about things. Um, it's really, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, in that sense, it really is kind of community though. You know, it's like, you know, I went to undergrad with Jen and then she went to art center for her graduate program. I went to Otis and, you know, we both graduated and then uh, it's like, you know, 98 or whatnot. And I still am in touch with Jennifer over there. It's like the Hollywood squares. <laughs> no, but then you went to teach at Art Center and she went to teach at Otis now. Yeah. So it's like, but then she also, I remember like, you know, it was like the people she had gone to school with, like, you know, students started a gallery, you know, and then that gallery, like, you know, got uh, lots of people that were in the program with them to exhibit. But then you know, those people also reached out to other people, you know, so that like, you know, I knew Jennifer and Jennifer knew these people. And um, I think that's cool. And it still happens today. You know, I just got an email uh, from a student that graduated last year from the master's program at Art Center, and she's opened a space. And so this is like, this is so cool, you know, when you think about I don't know, <clears throat> like maybe the commercialism or the art market gallery and then like, you know, graduate programs and education and academia or something. I, I don't know. It's like there's like both poles exist. I, I don't think it's like either or or something, but it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I'll just say that, you know, again, as someone who has 30 years in, in teaching, um, you know, New York, um, LA, Chicago, I taught in London, you know, the, the network of what's been created for me out of that, I couldn't have done any way else. The commercial, you know, the gallery, you know, like, like that, that, and it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a weird duck in the whole thing because the majority of my teaching has been on kind of the studio side of the art school. Like I have taught more academic classes, but you know, most students over my career want to be in their studios, not necessarily want to be at the lectern. And I'm not really an academic, you know, I, I mean, I was, uh, our, I moved to New York to get an MFA and then things changed. That was the plan. But the, 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 the I mean, I always tell students, I said, you're likely going to learn more about your own work from the, the fellow students in your situation whose work is the least like yours. Mm. Or the work that you think you, <laughs> or the think you, the work you think you can't stand, or the, you know, students are always wanting to know if I thought something, if I like something or not. I said you should be concerned if I think it's good or not, relative to what you're trying to do. You know, that those experiences, they are invaluable, and I think the art school is getting a lot of bad rap, you know, and and rightly so in many ways. But the the art schools are a great place for people to end up doing lots of different things too. I mean, the three of you have maintained the model in your own unique ways of being the contemporary artist, but I'm just as uh, proud of the student. I have students who started uh, craft breweries and restaurants and bands and, you know, and that, that, that get back to Mario, your point about, you said it yesterday too, about what an art education really is. I mean, Baldessari's great line, which is so spot on, is that to, to have an art school, you just bring the best artists in town, bring them together with the students and let the students teach themselves. You know, and I, I do think that that interaction, but Mario, you said something really great about yeah. that yesterday. Yeah, I was, I, I think about that because when Kim brings up the idea of community and the space that the school makes, I was thinking that for me, like I've always thought about it being like, you're not going to art school for an art education. You're going to learn the apparatus to you art as a vehicle for education so like any subject matter that you want to apply yourself to like through the lens of art or history or the sciences or whatever like art has been through all those fields been there dug that touched it like you know Jennifer's talking about science and 
uh, art has been her vehicle to understand, you know, sciences, the sciences. So um, I think it gives us a really great toolbox for being able to explore our lives in the world and set us up to being lifelong learners. The difference is, is that we have an output somehow. Like it, it teaches us to get, have an output, whether it's a painting, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a, uh, some kind of diagram. Um, it get, we have a, a kind of feedback system for the world. And I, I think that's the biggest um, strength that art school gives us. I, Je yeah, I think- Jennifer, it yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I also no, Jennifer, I want you to weigh in. Hi, but I'm like, I, I, thinking about like cultural, like about culture too, and about like production, co co crafting, and co producing culture. And I don't know at Otis, there's like this kind of like discussion or debate between art and design. But like, I, you know, like art for me is it like art education. You can bring that anywhere. Like you can do anything. Kind of like how Tara was saying, like. You know, because for me, it's like, and it's very closely related to science, like thinking about like how, and I'm using it a Karen Barad term, but ethical onto epistemologies, which is like a big, big fancy word, but thinking about like, you know, how um, ontologies are co-produced, you know, the nature of being that then also simultaneously produces knowledge production, epistemology, and then ethics, like the, the effects of knowledge production and, be, and understanding how all of that is co-produce so to me that's like what a what a what an art education is and that can be applied to anything and then you can go and you can infiltrate as a ceo at some you know major corporation and like totally restructure the the way that it works you know so like it, that's that to me that's what an art education yeah and i'll just say as some as as the old one in the group here you know i was taught by people that had artists who had been revolutionized by the, in the 70s, the release of the book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, which, which Thomas, that may not be his first name, but it was where you get where, where science got the idea of finally labeling what's called the paradigm shift of how science is incremental. And there's this tip, the paradigm shift, this tipping moment that had such a big influence as modernism was sort of raging in art that I think led to the dismantling of modernism to postmodernism. And I was taught by people that that book, so I, I had to read it. They were like, you, re you know, read this book. <laughs> so like, we all do that too, like passing on and opening things up. Um, we're, we're, we're at the time we've just got, I just saw, there just were a couple questions, but there was one, let me look back here from David Beer. Um, just the, the question, what advice do you all have for artists just starting their careers? I, I, I would say um, build your community, you know. Um, you know, you've got a friend that makes work, like make sure you keep a discussion with them. You, you visit visit their studio, they visit your studio and, and, and um, build your community. And, yeah, that that's yeah. going to keep your your art your art kind of practice and brain like healthy. I think. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that I think that Kim is right. You need to stay in communication with people the the same way you would build in time to make your art, like you spend in your studio, like you spend days in your studio making stuff. I always tell my students, spend time communicating with people, like either text them, call them, FaceTime them, Zoom with them, like we're doing now, because staying in communication with each other, I think is like a key and you need to build that into your schedule just the same way you would have your studio time built in. Yeah, and knowing what community you want to be a part of, because I, I mean, the first thing I would ask was like, what do you mean by career? Like, what is a career to you? What kind of career? You know, like, is your art career, like, look like a more traditional, like, kind of route, like, galleries and museums? Or are you interested in, like, you know, starting alternative schools, like Mario? Or, you know, are you interested in, like, infiltrating, you know, corporate America? Or, you know, like, are you, you want to, you know, and, like, find, and, like, once you kind of understand, like, what it is that you want, then you find the people, you, you, you know, and then do what like Kim and Mario are suggesting and like form community around that so that you can help each other. Uh, another, the other, another question that the uh, anonymous viewer has asked is just, you know, this is huge, of course, but how has the pandemic impacted your creative process? I mean, like, you know, I don't, you know, <laughs> I mean, 
anyone want to share? I'll just say this is uh, I, at the beginning of this, I was very, very scared in the beginning of the pandemic. Like I reacted in a very, I was very actually like really scared. And so I made a decision at the beginning that I was going to make art throughout the whole pandemic and conduct business as usual or as much as I could, you know, I have a child at home, um, but to try to get in the studio and, and use it as an opportunity to, um, you know, go off-roading basically in the studio uh, because the volume of the art world was slightly kind of muted. Um, so the voices that normally you might hear um, were not audible. Um, so it, I, I use the pandemic as kind of like a time to just like really make crazy work and then also to uh you know you know keep not keep busy but just kind of like well you told us yesterday also teach algebra oh yeah and also i'm, I'm very, quite now very i'm very very <laughs> proficient in fifth grade math <laughs> um, <laughs> and you told us yesterday that you were a very tough teacher I'm a, I'm and that your son teacher. was probably happy to go back to school so yeah. I'm not surprised. I mean, Kim, you know, Kim is such a painting nerd and I, that's an honorific, but I call someone that like, you know, I used to bring kid student groups to her studio just because I knew they would get like, it was just like, you know, that's painting awesome. nerd, you know, <laughs> like just really deep dives, but you're all deep divers in, in, in the work you do. That's what, that's to me, why you've been so successful. Um, and I don't mean successful in terms of the career, the limit, limited idea of career that maybe Jennifer you're but but in terms you know I, I, I mean I get at because I've been in the art schools for so long you know how do people define success and you know uh, that you're making the work whatever that is that you want to make that success um, yeah. and you know I, I know artists that the best thing in the world was that they got a job in something completely different that was sort of circumscribed for them and they could go do that job for a bit and then ignore it till they went back and that's what they wanted. Sometimes yeah. I found that like, you know, students project onto us all too. Like I had to disabuse students. I said, look, I couldn't, I, I wasn't, it wasn't possible for me to make my living as a writer and independent curator. I fell into teaching, you know, like, you, you, yes, I love it and all of that, but um, it's not, it's the teaching is augmenting me doing my own work too. Yeah. And, you know, that balance is um, tough for everybody, but I think the three of you have, have managed it um, impeccably well. Um, you can kind of sense in what I'm doing, I'm kind of getting to the wrapping up point because we're, we're at 12.59, but I don't know if anyone, any of you have any sort of final thoughts or anything you want to say? Keep the overhead low. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I moved back full time. I am, I am in my rent control place. I am living so cheaply now. It's so great. Yeah. Harder for artists, though. You need stuff. You need material. Even, even Jennifer. You know, like even the most conceptual artists. Still, it's the 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 upkeep of doing it is something that I recognize and I don't have in the same way. Well, that was great, you guys. I mean, we could go on. Um, um, so I just want to, on behalf of the Venice Family Clinic, again, check out the, the, the auction on Artsy. Um, keep paying attention next year and the years to come. Um, it is as worthwhile of a cause as there is out there. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. And this was extra special to have the three of you here and the synergy that was there from the moment, you know, um, I hope that came through the audience, to the audience, I'm, I'm sure it did. So thank you guys, thank you, Kim, Jennifer, Mario, so much for doing this. Mario thank and Jennifer Terry. and Terry, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel like we all need to get together and do like drinks or coffee or donuts or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's and gonna that, happen soon, so thank okay. you so much. Terry, and, yeah. you're, not, you're not the old one, you're a yelder, a young elder. Oh, okay. Okay, well, when I was a kid, I used to hate always looking younger than I was. Now I'm happy that I look younger than I am. So, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like people, like how have you taught the art school for 30 years? I'm like, I started when I was 25, which is a little sick in some ways. But, um, 
Um, it just is what it is. So, um, great. Thank you all, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Love y'all. Be safe. Love.